It is a story that could well be a spy movie, a thriller set right in the heart of the Cold War. But above all, it's a deep trauma for dozens of families. In the 1970s and 80s, North Korea organised a kidnapping campaign in enemy countries. One of its closest neighbours, Japan, therefore a target. The programme decided at the highest level of the communist state most likely intended to train North Korean spies in foreign languages and customs. It was not until 2002, though, that the North Korean dictator at the time officially recognised what happened in a conversation with the Japanese Prime Minister. I protested very strongly to Kim Jong-il. He confessed, honestly, that North Koreans had kidnapped our citizens. Pyongyang finally admitted to 13 abductions and eventually sent some of the Japanese back to their homes. Japan says it believes there were more like 17 kidnappings, but others say there could have been many more, perhaps even hundreds across the world. There is, though, one case that really stands out, that of Megumi Yokota, a young girl kidnapped almost half a century ago in Niigata, on the Japanese coast opposite North Korea. She has never been returned, North Korea saying she died, but her parents and her supporters continue their campaign. Louis Bellin, Philippe Chambre, Justin McCurry and Aruna Popery revisit Niigata for France 24. For most of the past 45 years, Takuya Yokota has been on a mission to find out what happened to his sister, Megumi. He was just a young boy when she went missing during a journey she'd made countless times before, walking home from school. That night, my mother took us, my brother and I, and we started looking for her in the neighborhood using a torch. That's how it all started. I felt that something was wrong. I was only nine years old, so I ended up falling asleep. My mother thought Megumi was going to come home and wasn't particularly worried. But she hadn't returned by the following morning or evening. That situation continued. In my 54 years, that week was the toughest of my life. Megumi's name and face have left a mark on the Japanese people. They belong to a happy young girl who loved natural sciences and are on display in photos alongside Takuya and her other twin brother. The family photo album is all that is left from that time. The memories ended when she disappeared. Here are family photos taken before she disappeared. We were a happy family, just like any other family. These pictures remind me of happy times. I would like to go back to that period in our lives. After she disappeared, we felt it was taboo to ask our parents about our sister. We could see that they are doing everything possible to maintain as normal a family life as possible. It was hard, especially for my parents. There was less laughter between us, and we talked less. The Yokotas had questions, but no answers. Had she run away? Had she drowned in the sea, or was it something else? The police kept all options open. Her brother held on to the possibility that she was still alive. When it rains or snows, I wonder if she's okay. I think of her every day. When I see a woman in the street leading an ordinary family life with her children, I think of the happy life Megumi could have had here. A picture began to form of what might have been behind Megumi's disappearance. The Cold War was at its peak and her home in North Korea was separated by a thousand kilometers of sea. Pyongyang had started abducting people in locations worldwide, including South Korea and Europe, and along Japan's coastline. Its agents snatched dozens, possibly hundreds, of people to educate other spies in the language and customs of their home countries. Megumi Yokota, it turned out, 
was one of their first victims, taken from near her home in Niigata, an industrial city on the coast. Megumi's photo was taken between this tree and this one. Takashi Hara, a reporter, has always lived in Niigata. Soon after he began his career in journalism in the early 2000s, he started looking into Megumi's disappearance. Her fate still haunts him. We're in front of the high school where Megumi Yokota studied until she was abducted on the 15th of November 1977. It is noon right now, but at that time she'd left school just after 6 p.m. Winter wasn't far off, so it was already dark. Hara has retraced Megumi's footsteps countless times. The spot where she's thought to have been taken is just 500 meters from her high school, where she'd been playing badminton. She was alone, but her home was just a short walk away. There was no light, so it was completely dark. Megumi Yokota was supposedly kidnapped at this intersection. Police sniffer dogs started circling here and lost Megumi's scent. A nearby resident told me she'd heard someone cry out between 6.30 and 7.00 p.m. They could have been cries for help. She said it sounded like the feeble voice of a young girl. If only she hadn't ignored the cries and closed her window, things might have worked out differently. Police officers searched forests, rivers and beaches but there was no sign of Megumi. In fact, her abductors had either tied her up or bundled her into a large sack and driven her to the coast. She was taken by boat to North Korea, from a beach like this one. When I was small, there was a strange atmosphere in Niigata. It was the Cold War, and the Sea of Japan was a tense place. Children playing on the beach were often warned they could be taken away by foreign men arriving by sea. It's a terrible memory. I thought at the time that it could have happened to me. Many children thought the same. A turning point came in 2002, when Junichiro Koizumi became the first Japanese Prime Minister to visit the North Korean capital, Pyongyang. As a goodwill gesture, North Korea's then leader, Kim Jong-il, admitted his regime had abducted Megumi and 12 other Japanese citizens. The admission shocked Japan. Little is known about Megumi's life in North Korea. This is one of the few photos sent by officials in Pyongyang, where she reportedly lived under constant surveillance and taught the Japanese language and culture to spies. <laughs> Kim Jong-il said the abductions had ended years earlier, but some in Niigata suspect otherwise. I tell my children never to come home alone, to always have someone with them. Of course it's possible. You never know. I avoid going out alone, particularly at night or very early in the morning. The abductions happened nearby, so we worry. The clock is ticking for the families of the victims. Megumi's father died in 2020, the case of his daughter unresolved. At 86, her mother is losing patience. We met her and Megumi's brother in Tokyo. Good morning, everybody. More than 40 years have passed since it happened. 
Even if only two or three people were abducted in this way, any country would be angry and do everything possible to get them back. They might even use force. But we still don't know what really happened. I'm angry. Every year, the Yokota family meets the families of other abductees and politicians who support their cause. They have one objective to put pressure on the government to do more to help their loved ones. Japan's Prime Minister is among those attending today's meeting. The abductees and their families are getting older. So there is no time to lose to resolve this issue. I am ready to meet Kim Jong-un face-to-face without preconditions. But Kishida's comments leave a bitter taste. The family have heard those words numerous times over the years, yet nothing has changed. And while the actual number of victims could be around 900, Japan's government recognizes only 17. This woman is convinced that Pyongyang is behind the disappearance of her sister in Tokyo 50 years ago. My sister would be 82 years old today. I'm concerned about whether or not she is still alive in North Korea. The police's approach to investigating abductions differs if the victims are not officially recognized. As far as I'm concerned, the government has done nothing. After Koizumi's meeting with Kim in 2002, North Korea returned five abductees to Japan. Kazuhiro Araki was at the airport to meet them. They're leaving the plane here. Their families and supporters were there to welcome them. When we arrived in the hometown of one of the returnees, employees at the town hall had got together to give them a warm welcome. Everyone was saying, it's great you have returned. But we didn't know how the abductees really felt. They had children in North Korea and had left them there. So psychologically, it would have been hard for them to say anything critical about the North Korean regime. They dare not say too much. North Korea claims that all of the remaining abductees recognized by Japan, including Megumi, have died. The regime insists that the case is now closed. But this activist believes some of the abductees are still alive. To start with, here is some information about the Japanese abduction victims. Araki broadcasts for three hours a day in Japanese and Korean from this studio in Tokyo. But he won't be heard in North Korea, which has jammed his broadcasts. This is the sound of the interference they use to block our message. Araki has reached out directly to the abductees for 17 years, but of course he's had no response. He doesn't know if Megumi is even alive. Japan has turned to its main ally, the US, to increase pressure on Pyongyang. Earlier this year, the US Embassy in Tokyo for the first time sent a representative to suspected abduction sites, including Niigata. The Yokota family has also come to the embassy um, to share with us the heartbreaking story of how Megumi Yokota was abducted, but nothing has prepared me for what I witnessed today. The United States is in solidarity um, with the family of the um, abductees and the victims themselves, um, and we're committed to them. In May, 
U.S. President Joe Biden met the Yokotas and other abductees' relatives on the sidelines of a summit in Japan. The Yokotas have also appealed to former Presidents Bush, Obama and Trump for help, but no progress has been made. North Korea stopped responding to Japanese demands over the abductees several years ago. In Niigata, people refuse to forget Megumi, clinging to the faint hope that 45 years after she disappeared, she will one day be reunited with her family. Louis Bella, Philippe Chambray, Justin McCurry and Aruna Popere revisiting Niigata for France 24. Well, that's all from this week's edition. You can catch it and all the previous editions as well on our website at france24.com. Thanks very much for watching. More news coming up shortly.